Let's turn to Acts chapter 9, beginning tonight with verse 32. The church in Jerusalem has sent Paul off to Tarsus, and now our attention turns from Paul to Peter. And we read, as came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all of the quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. The church has been expanding quite rapidly. As a result of the persecution, we read back in chapter 8 that at that time there was great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And down in verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. As a result, the church had spread throughout all of Judea. As the people moved away from Jerusalem because of the persecution, settling in the little villages throughout Judea, everywhere they are going, they are sharing their uh, newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And multitudes are being added to the church daily. Now, it would appear that Peter had decided to go throughout the regions of Judea, visiting the churches uh, to minister to these fledgling, fledgling little flocks. And probably... Uh, the same reason that Paul wrote to the Romans, his desire to come to them. As Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he, he expressed his desire to come, that he might impart to them some spiritual gift, that by his coming, uh, they, mo bo most, both, <laughs> they both should be edified. Uh, that is, Paul would be blessed by his coming, but he would be able to impart to them uh, some of the gifts of the Spirit that God was using through his life, and thus they would be benefited by the gifts of the Spirit working in Paul. So we find that uh, the first mention is Peter then coming to the church in Lydda. Notice he is visiting the saints that dwelt in Lydda. It is interesting that the New Testament refers to all of the believers as saints. God recognizes you as a saint if you have come to put your faith in Jesus Christ. I believe that the Catholic Church has done a great disservice to the body of Christ by sort of setting apart certain of the uh, people within the church who have done perhaps uh, wonderful deeds uh, and has chose to canonize them and call them saints. And the tendency is to put people then in various categories and in, in order, some higher, some lower in uh, the body of Christ so that, you know, some are to be held and revered and others, well, you're just a commoner kind of a thing. And, and sort of the developing of a caste system within the church. Absolutely wrong. In Christ, we are all on the same level because Christ is all and in all. And never was there established really a hierarchy as far as certain people looking, being looked up to, prayed to and whatever, and being called the saints. Everyone who believed and followed were called saints. And so you're a saint. Now act like it. Uh, <laughs> but I love it, the, the fact that the Lord 
just looks at us all the same. And uh, he, he's just as interested in you as he is anybody else. You are important to him and he wants you to know that. And he wants you to feel that. That you are very important to him. And as far as the New Testament is concerned, we are all called saints. St. Charles has a nice ring, doesn't it? In the morning when you get up and look in the mirror, you're looking at a saint. How about that? Now, Lydda was a village on the, in the plains of Sharon. Uh, it uh, was about two-thirds of the way from Jerusalem to Joppa. In fact, Lydda today is adjacent to the Ben-Gurion airport. So that if you go to Israel and you fly into the international Ben-Gurion airport, you're actually flying into the site of the village of Lydda where Peter came to visit the saints that were there. There in Lydda, there was a man by the name of Aeneas who had been a paralytic for eight years years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Arise and make your bed. Now here we see three spiritual gifts in operation through Peter. The gift of miracles. Because when a man has been an invalid, paralyzed, for eight years, and suddenly he's able to get up and make his bed, that's a miracle. And so the Bible speaks about the gifts of miracles. And surely Peter possessed that gift of miracles. But also we see here the gift of faith. Now, the Bible also speaks of the gift of faith, and that is more than just uh, believing faith. The Bible says that unto everyone is given a measure of faith. But then in the list of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, there is a reference to the gifts and the gift of faith. And this is when God gives you the faith to believe and trust him for a certain thing. And it's difficult to describe just how it works. But it's just that there are certain things you just have the faith. That you know it's going to be okay. And, and the Lord just gives you that faith. And, and you act then upon that faith. He spoke to this man. The word of faith. Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes you whole. That was the word of faith that he spoke to the man. We find Paul speaking the word of faith to a crippled in Lystra. He perceived that the man had faith to be healed and he said to him, Brother, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Rise up and walk. And speaking the word of faith, the man acted on it. Now, Jesus often spoke the word of faith to people. When he came to the synagogue in Capernaum, there was a man there with a withered hand, and Jesus said to him, stretch forth your hand. That was the word of faith. Stretch forth your hand. And the man stretched forth his hand, and it was whole like the other. To the leper, Jesus said, be cleansed. That's the word of faith that he spoke to him. And the man was cleansed from the leprosy. To the cripple, Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. And the man took up his bed and walked, responding to the word of faith. And then to Lazarus, who was lying there in the tomb, Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> and here he was dead 
buried for four days, and responding to this powerful word of faith, Lazarus came forth. So as the result of the miracle, all of those who were dwelling in Lydda and Sharon saw the man and they turned to the Lord. They realized Indeed, Jesus is risen from the dead. And the power in the name of Jesus, as Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, that will I do that the Father might be glorified in the Son. And here in the name of Jesus, he commands the man to be healed. Now, the miracle then of salvation. You see, the miracle of the lame man being healed led to many miracles. Many people turned to the Lord. Salvation is probably one of the greatest miracles of all. Healing of a paralyzed man is truly a miracle, but no greater than the miracle of the transformation that takes place in the life of a person who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ. People who have been spiritually paralyzed, now able to walk. People who have been spiritually blind, now able to see. For a person to say that they don't believe in miracles for today are denying salvation because salvation is a miracle. One day the disciples asked Jesus, who can be saved? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The miracle of salvation. Many miracles of salvation followed the miracle of of the healing of the lame man there at uh, Aeneas at Lydda. Now, Peter goes from Lydda to the seaport of Joppa. Evidently, the news that Peter was in the area spread. Now, they didn't have telephones and cell phones and so forth in those days and people called and say hey Peter's over here you, can you believe that you know he came down from Jerusalem uh, they, they but they were moving back and forth and so those that were in Lydda going over to Joppa they were excited said Peter's here you know Peter's visiting and, and so they're in Joppa one of the dear saints in the church had died they washed her body and placed it in an upper room. And hearing that Peter was at Lydda, they sent some messengers over to Peter, requesting that he come quickly to Joppa. And so uh, Peter came on over to the fellowship in Joppa, where there was a, another group, body of believers, disciples of Jesus Christ. We're told that her name is Tabitha, and it declares which by interpretation is Dorcas. Now, a lot of times people wonder why those in the Bible often had two names. Notice her name was Tabitha, but it said, which is by interpretation, Dorcas. Uh, one was the Hebrew name, and the other was the Greek name. The Hebrew name was Tabitha, but in Greek it would have been Dorcas. Uh, it means a gazelle, uh, and uh, in uh, Hebrew, his name was Cephas. In Greek, it was Peter or Petros. Saul was the Hebrew name. Paulus was the 
Greek name. Tabetha, the Hebrew name. Dorcas, the Greek name. Thomas, the Hebrew name. Didymus, the Greek name. So often they were referred to by the Greek name, sometimes by the Hebrew name, uh, but uh, one is Hebrew, the other is Greek, and that is why it seems that they have two names. Now we are told concerning this woman Dorcas that she was a woman of good works and known for the alms deeds which she did. She was one of those special kind of person who was very caring. In Romans, Paul spoke of the gift of helps and she had the gifts of helps. When we get to heaven, there are so many wonderful people that we will want to meet. I am looking forward to meeting Dorcas. She's that special kind of a woman who was always helping others. Sewing clothes for the children of the poor. Making little coats. And just uh, one of those special kind of women. A special saint. And incidentally, got her name in the Bible. So that when you talk about Dorcas, we all think of uh, a, a woman who is given over to kind deeds. In fact, uh, a lot of churches have a, a ladies' sewing circle that's known as the Dorcas Fellowship. And uh, they, again, sort of draw the name from uh, this special lady uh, that lived there in Joppa. We have those kind of persons here in our church. And how we thank God for them. People who will use the talents that God has given to minister to the needs of others. Beautiful gift. But unfortunately, Dorcas was sick and she died. And so they washed her body, put her in an upper room, sent for Peter. And since Joppa is only about 10 miles from Lydda, Peter made haste and he came. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room where they had placed her body. And the widows had gathered, and they were there weeping. And they began to show to Peter the coats and the garments that Dorcas had made while she was still alive. Uh, just declaring what a wonderful woman she was and and the weeping of, of the widows that were there. You really miss a person like this when they're gone. You wonder if anybody will be able to really take their place. And many times it seems like there's such a unique uh, place in the body that no one steps in to adequately fulfill the uh, slot that they had been fulfilling within the body. But we usually think of them very selfishly. We do not think of the great joy that they have now in the presence of the Lord. But we think, oh, they made this coat for my little boy. I'm going to miss her, you know. And, and we are sorrowful and weeping selfishly. Because... They were a benefit and a blessing to us. And we feel now that sense of loss. And thinking of ourselves, we weep. But in reality, if we are really thinking of them, they're in the presence of the Lord. And they're in all of the glory of heaven. You know, we would rejoice for them. Weep for ourselves. We are oftentimes begging the Lord not to take our loved ones. Even when they've come to the place where they are in pain or discomfort. Or if they die, we say, Lord, please send them back. 
And usually we talk about all of the wonderful things that they did and how we related to them and how much we're going to miss them. The tender love and care that they gave to us. When my mother was dying, I would slip into her room many times and just sit there quietly. And usually... I look at those hands of hers, beautiful hands. I begin to think of all of the times those hands comforted me when they were laid on my fevered brow when I was a child. I would think of all of the meals that those hands had prepared for me as I was growing up, all of the pies and the cookies and the rolls that were baked. I'd think of my Clothes that those hands had washed for so many years and those old-fashioned washers with the dryers hung them out on the lines. I think of all of the pajamas that they had sewed for me and the shirts that they had made. And as I would sit there, I would begin to weep in the memory of all of the blessings that those hands had brought into my life. I did not want her to go. And yet I knew that she was in pain. And many times pastors would come and they would pray, Lord, heal. And when they would leave, she would turn to me and she'd say, I wasn't agreeing with them when they prayed for me. (laughs) She said, I want to go and be with Jesus. And yet selfishly, I wanted to hold on to her. I wanted to keep her. And so it is so many times. We think of ourselves, we don't think of the person who is now in the presence of the Lord. And sometimes I think that the only reason why the Lord leaves us here is for the sake of others. Paul the Apostle, when he wrote to the church in Philippi, spoke of the mixed emotions that he had. He said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, for your sake, it's important that I stay here for a while. So the Lord was leaving him for the sake of his ministry to the people. Yet Paul, in expressing his own desire, said, I would like to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. They were all weeping. They were showing Peter all of the clothes that she had made and telling of the wonderful deeds that this woman had done. And Peter put them all out of the room. I think that Peter was probably remembering another occasion. It was when the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, had come to Jesus because his little daughter was dying. Twelve-year-old daughter. The light and the joy of his life. And he came to Jesus asking him to come to heal his little daughter. And as they were on the way to heal the daughter, messengers came and said, don't trouble the master any further. Your daughter died. And Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. When they came to the home, the mourners had already gathered. You could hear the wailing from up the street as Jesus was approaching. And as he came into the house, all of this wailing. And Jesus said, you can stop that. She's only asleep. And they began to laugh him to scorn. And so he put them all out of the house, ordered them out. And he took Peter, James, and John, 
And he went into the room where this little body was lying. And Jesus said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is little maiden, arise. And she sat up, and Jesus presented her to her father. Peter now has sent all of the people out of the room, and he knelt and he prayed. And then turning to the body, he said, Tabetha Kumi. Very close to what Jesus said. Jesus said, Talitha Kumi. Peter said, Tabetha Kumi. Tabetha, arise. And we read that she opened her eyes and looked at Peter. And she sat up. And we read that Peter gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Now I'm sure that the saints were rejoicing. But I wonder about Tabetha. <laughs> you suppose she was rejoicing? <laughs> there she was in the presence of the Lord, just looking around, seeing the beauties and the glories of heaven, and suddenly she opens her eyes and there's Peter. <laughs> I wonder if he really did her a favor. Now, he did the church a favor. There's no question about that. Because you really miss a person like this. And so the church, he did a great favor for. But I would suppose that personally for her, it wasn't much of a favor. Paul the Apostle was given a visit to heaven by the Lord. And later as he describes it, he said it was so awesome that there are no words that can describe it. It would be a crime to attempt to describe it in human language. And after that, Paul wanted more than anything else to return to heaven. Hard to stay on the earth after that experience. What will it be? The first moment in heaven. Can you imagine? No, you can't. <laughs> it, it, it defies the, the imagination even. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I think that we make a mistake that when we oftentimes think of death as defeat. Death is victory. As Paul said, we know that when this earthly tent, our bodies are dissolved, when they go back to dust. We have a building of God. That is a new body. It's not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. So then we who are in these bodies often groan as we earnestly desire to be freed from our bodies. Not that we would be an unembodied spirit. But our desire is to be clothed upon with the body which is from heaven. For we know that as long as we are living in these bodies, we are absent from the Lord. But we would choose rather to be absent from these bodies that we might be present with the Lord. I've heard say of some people, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I haven't met that person yet. I think that one of our problems is that we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good many times. I think that's a far more accurate statement. We get so caught up in the earthly mundane things that we don't think enough about heaven. 
What a glorious day. When we move out of the tent, Paul said, we who are in these bodies earnestly desire to be freed, not to be unembodied, but to be clothed upon with the body which is from heaven. If we only knew what God has in store for us throughout eternity. So, the news of Tabitha's being raised from the dead, you can imagine how that spread through Joppa and the surrounding communities. And as the result, many believed in the Lord. One miracle led to other miracles. And that is so often the way it goes. Miracles of God lead to the miracles of salvation. And so we find the ministry of Peter to the churches. And and the glorious working of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit through Peter's life. Was Peter something special? Not really. He was just a plain fisherman before the Lord met him. He had his flaws and his failures just like everybody else. Jesus said to Peter one time, Peter, you offend me because you can't tell the difference when God is speaking to you or when your own heart is speaking to you. Again, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I've been praying for you that your faith wouldn't fail. And when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. And we know that Peter, when the chips were down, denied that he ever knew his Lord. Now, that, I know that you shouldn't take comfort in another man's failures, but I do. (laughs) It comforts me to know that You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. Peter wasn't perfect. We should not put him on a pedestal. He wasn't perfect. He was just an ordinary person like you and me. And if God can use ordinary people, then he can use me and he can use you. And none of us should excuse ourselves from service, from serving God. When God called Jeremiah, God said, before you were ever formed in the womb, I knew you. And I ordained that you should actually prophesy unto the kings and all. And Jeremiah said, not me. I'm only a teenager. Who's going to listen to me? And it's so typical of so many of us. Moses said, I can't do that. I I don't speak well. I can't really talk without stammering. And it seems like everybody can frame some kind of an excuse why God can't use you. Wrong. God can use and desires to use every one of us. For a particular niche in the body. You may be as Tabitha. With the gifts of help. Reaching out and ministering to those that are in need. You may be as Peter. God may want to anoint you with the power of his spirit. Give you the gift of miracles and the gifts of faith. And use you marvelously. To demonstrate to the world that Jesus lives. But even the very thought of that, we shrink away from it, don't we? No, that can never happen to me. Maybe to someone else, not to me. And we are 
automatically dismissing ourselves from being what God would make us and what God might want us to be because of our unwillingness. We look at ourselves and our unworthiness that we see rather than looking at God and the power that he wants to bestow upon us. So, God is calling people. People to serve him. To use the talents that he has given you for his glory. Are you willing to be used by God? He'll use each one of us It will just give him the opportunity to do so. Father, we thank you for this lesson that we have before us of this man, Peter. Just a common, ordinary fisherman who, when he yielded his life to you and was filled with the Spirit, he became uncommon in the works that he accomplished for you and for the kingdom. Lord, there are people here tonight that you've been speaking to. You want to put your hand upon them. You want to put your spirit upon their lives. You desire to use them, Lord, in a wonderful way. They've been excusing themselves. They've been giving you the reasons why you can't use them. But Lord, dissolve those excuses. And may we tonight, Lord, surrender our lives anew to you. That you might use us, Lord, as you desire in the work of the eternal kingdom of God. Lord, we know that all of the things that we do for ourselves the kingdoms that we build for ourselves are wood, hay, and stubble. And when the works are tested by fire, they will all burn. But Lord, that which we do for you will remain eternally. And so may we, Lord, devote ourselves more and more to the works of thy eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.